Last week we started this series talking about what it means to be a disciple. And we talked about uh, this idea of Jesus being the king, Jesus being our master. And if we're truly going to be his disciples, then we need to do what he's told us to do. If you, if you didn't, weren't here last week, if you weren't able to be a part of that, then I want to really encourage you to go online and check that out. I know that the audio version is up. Uh, and the video version will be up as well soon, I know. And, and, and those are, it's, it's going to be foundational for where we are as a church and where we're headed uh, as a church. So if you haven't checked that out yet, if you weren't able to be here last week, uh, be sure to go online so that you can uh, watch the video from last week or listen to the audio from last week so that you understand how this, this idea begins and where this idea goes and, and, and where this idea of being a disciple will take us uh, as, a, as a church body and as a body of believers in, in the future. The idea is, and you can kind of see it in the graphic, is the idea is that if we're going to flourish, if we're going to grow, if we're going to uh, bear fruit for Christ, well, then we have to be uh, have solid roots and we have to be rooted in Him and we have to be have Jesus as our foundation. And so Jesus is our king and we need to do what he has told us to do. And that's the idea, the premises that, la that we talked about last week. And that, that brings us into, uh, as we continue next week, we'll kind of hit a little pause button. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later on. And then, and then the following week after that, we'll wrap this series up talking about the cost of being a disciple. Costs and the benefits of being a disciple and what that means. And that will lead us into our, our summer series on Revelation, which hopefully you guys are excited about. I am. And hopefully you've been uh, talking to your friends and family about that uh, as well. And so what does it mean for us to be disciples? How do we live as disciples in this world? One of the things that, uh, that we know about people is we can usually identify people by the types of tools they use. So if you have a guy that, that comes to your house and he's got a hammer and a saw and, and, and nails and those kind of things, you might think that this guy's a carpenter. Or if this guy pulls up to your house and he's got uh, you know, meters and gauges and, and Freon, you might think, well, this guy, he, he's going to be working on the, on the heating and air system. Or, or maybe you go out somewhere and you've, you've got an appointment and somebody walks up to you and, and around their neck they have a, a stethoscope. And so this person's a nurse or, or this person's a doctor, somebody who's going to take care of you, take care of you physically. And so we begin to identify people by the types of tools they use. How many of you in your lifetime, maybe it was uh, when you were younger or maybe now or maybe uh, you know, you've seen somebody even, or maybe it's not you, but, but somebody you know who's had a letter that meant a lot to them. Raise your hand if you've, you've had a letter, somebody's written you a letter, or you have a letter, some, something of, of value. A lot of us are like that because we, we value these kind of things. And then this week as I was thinking about this idea of valuable letters, I, I decided to, to look up the most valuable letter that was ever written uh, in terms of dollar figures. <clears throat> And I expected to find a letter from Abraham Lincoln, you know, or, or George Washington, or some kind of some kind of big letter like that. And what I found out was that last year, at one of the, the famous auction houses, uh, the name of it slips my mind right now, but last year for six million dollars, a letter that was written by Francis Crick to his son Michael Crick in 1953. It was sold at auction last year for six million dollars. Now, some of you probably don't even recognize that name, Francis Crick. Who, who is that? In, in 1953, Francis Crick is the one who identified, discovered DNA. And so he wrote this letter, this, this seven-page letter to his son Michael, who at the time was 12 years old. And he wrote this huge, long letter this, to, to his 12-year-old son, which blows my mind. Uh, and I don't know how much of it his 12-year-old son actually was able to grasp, but... But he wrote this letter to his 12-year-old son detailing the secrets of life that he'd found. And as I was reading that, I thought, man, how interesting is that? Here we've got this guy who discovered DNA. He writes this letter to his son, and his letter is now sold for $6 million. If a famous athlete or, or maybe a, a world leader or somebody like that wrote you a letter, what, what, would, you, what would you do with that letter? I mean, probably, probably we would we'd put it on a mantle, right? We'd put it in a frame. We'd, we'd hang it on the wall. We'd say, man, look at this so that, you know, we'd pass that down. It'd become a family heirloom so that, you know, our kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, they would say, man, the, the, the prime minister wrote them a letter or the president or a famous athlete or somebody. They, they, this, is, this is magnificent. This is wonderful. But what we take for granted is that the creator of the universe, the creator of the universe, wrote us a letter revealing Himself to us and who we are in relation to Him, detailing aspects of who we are and what our life is about. He detailed the actual secrets of life. And that letter is the Bible. 
And it's our first tool of discipleship that we're going to be talking about this morning. If you see somebody, generally speaking, who's carrying around a, a hammer, you, you think they're a, a carpenter, but if you see someone who's carrying a Bible, you automatically assume that they're a disciple. It's our first tool of discipleship. This is God revealing Himself to us. In it, we learn who He is. We learn His, His, His plan for redemption for us because we learn of, of our sin and how our sin separates us from God. And we learn about His plan for redemption. And as we talk about being disciples and what that means for us and what that means for the world, the Word tells us what that looks like and what a disciple looks like and what a disciple, how a disciple lives out his life, how a disciple follows Jesus. <clears throat> I struggled this week a little bit because normally I like to stay in one, one passage of Scripture and kind of really go through that. And this week we're going to be bouncing around, so uh, bear with me as we do that a little bit different this week. Yeah, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And this is an interesting passage because, because it's, it's Jesus as He begins to launch His ministry, as He begins to go out and be this, this, this God-man who, who God sent to earth to, to redeem us, this plan that, of redemption that God started way back in the garden. Jesus is now coming to fulfill that. And in John chapter 4, we see Satan trying to derail that. And so I want to read for you just the first four verses. <clears throat> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And I just want to pause there because I, I want us to kind of take in this, this idea of what's, what's happening. Here Jesus has been fasting to prepare His time for ministry as He knows what's coming up. That I, He knows that He's got to reveal who He is to, to the world so that the, the world can understand about grace and redemption and all of these things through Christ, through Him. And so He's fasting and praying for these 40 days. And, and I don't know how many of you have gotten into a, a pattern of, of fasting and prayer. It's a, it's a really neat thing. I, I've done it just a, a very few times in my life. And I can go maybe a day or two. And, you know, I don't miss a lot of meals. Don't, you know, not, don't make a lot of jokes on that, I know. But imagine 40 days. And, you know, scientifically, I don't know how all this stuff happened. I don't understand it, to be sure. But Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and praying for 40 days. And here, Satan comes up to him with this temptation. And he says, if you truly are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus being Jesus, I'm sure could have called on the Father and said, let's do this, let's make this happen, and it would have happened. But Jesus answered him in verse 4. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so as Satan continued to tempt him with power and with fame and with glory and with all of these other things, Jesus continually rebuked Satan's advances by calling on Scripture. And He put His faith not in the things that He could see, not in the things that He could touch, not in the things that He was feeling inside Himself. He put His faith and His trust in the very Word of God. And we're called to do the same. We're called to put our trust in God, to listen to Him and to do His will. But how can we do that if we don't know His Word? One of the greatest tragedies, I think, is, uh, for, for the American church is that the American church is largely biblically illiterate. And it's happened gradually over time as people have gotten this idea that we understand Bible, we understand Scripture. I grew up in church, so I know. And we've gotten away from Bible studies, and we've gotten away from traditional Sunday school classes, and we've gotten away from traditional learning. And, and, and I'm not saying those, that's necessarily good or bad. It just it is. And because of many of those things, and because of many things like that, we've gotten away from a traditional understanding, a traditional knowledge of the Bible. When I was about 26, I think, I'm not sure, 25, 26 years old, I, I started Bible college, taking Bible college classes for the first time. And I thought, I'll sign up, you know, and I'll go, but <clears throat> I've been going to church my whole life. I pretty much know everything. <laughs> And so I would go to class, and I tell you, the, the, the first class, we had a couple classes that were outreach classes that were more laid back, real casual, different kind of professor. We, I went on campus, the very first time I went on campus and went into a class, and I was absolutely blown away. 
I could not believe how much I did not know. And, and honestly, to, to tell you, to be to be completely upfront, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And, and maybe for some of you that's scary because you're thinking, man, we're looking for you to lead us and we don't know. But there's just so much there to, to, to think that we can have a, a, a grasp of God's Word because we went to Sunday school as a kid is ridiculous. We have to, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, if we're going to follow the King, we have to be in the Word of God. Because in His Word, we find the will of the Father. We find the will of God in the Word of God. And so if we, you know, and a lot of people will ask this question, I, you know, I want to know what God's will is in my life. It's there. I want to know what God has for me. It's here. We need to dig into the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for repute, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And it goes on to say all of those things are so that we can be equipped for good works. So that we can have the proper tools that we need as we go and live out our lives as disciples of Jesus. So that we can be equipped, so that we can be able to handle the things that come our way in the world. I think I've told you before, but my favorite book of the Bible is, is the Gospel of John. And I don't really know why. I just know that it is. And it's John chapter 14, Jesus begins preparing His disciples and preparing the people that He knows for what He knows is coming, which is His death. And later on, His resurrection. But they, they don't understand this yet. They can't, they can't really grasp this yet. For them, this is a, a strange concept because in their minds, they think like probably we would think. If we're going to have a, a leader who leads us, he can't die. And so they're, they're kind of confused. And Jesus begins to say, where I'm going, you can't go. And I'm going to be gone. And you've got to be ready. And all of these things. And so Jesus then in chapter uh, 17 begins to pray for these guys. Because he knows that these guys need it, just like we need it. He, he goes to the Father and he says, be, be with them and, and they love you as I love you. And, he, and he's praying to the Father about all of these things. And in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says something that's interesting in his prayer. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And in the word of God, we find the very truth that so many people in our world are so hungry for. I mean, how many people do you know, whether they would understand it in this sense or not, are longing for the truth about God? They, they want to know what God has for them. They want to know if, if He's even real, if He's there for them, if He cares for them. And so, so many people longing for the truth about God search it out in other areas through chemical abuse or through relationships or, or all kinds of other things. They'll search for the truth of God whether they know that's what they're searching for or not. And later on, as we go through John, Jesus is arrested. And He's standing before Pilate, which is an interesting scene. And Pilate asks Him in the end of verse 37, He says, or Jesus says to Pilate, everyone who is of the truth listens to My voice. And basically Jesus is saying, everybody who's in the truth, everybody who knows the truth, those are the people who listen to Me. And Pilate asks Him this question that is so profound. Pilate looks at Jesus after Jesus had just made this statement and Pilate says, what is truth? And what Pilate doesn't know, and whether Jesus did this on purpose or not, but we find the answer this three chapters prior when Jesus is praying to God and He says, your word is truth. And in our society, we look for truth. We long for truth. We want to know the truth. And so many of us have it. Every single day. In the palm of our hands. The truth is the Word of God. And so as disciples, we need to take this tool, this tool of truth, and be in the Word of God. Develop a, a reading plan or a study plan or, or some type of learning where you can get in the Word of God and, and grow and understand. And trust me, you will never completely understand God no matter how much you understand the Word of God. But we need to begin to grow and continue to grow. And for some of you, you're, you're farther down the path than some of other, others of us. 
but, but always be continually developing this understanding of who God is by understanding the truth of His Word. I, I think probably what works best, and what works best for me anyway, is to have a set time. And this is where, where sometimes I get mix, mixed up, my times get messed up, and I end up uh, falling short of this, this desire. But when you have a set time and a set place where you can get into God's Word, then, then it's easy to get into that routine. And just like bad habits are developed, good habits can be developed. And, and we, can, we need to, as disciples, get into a habit, a good habit of being in God's Word. And last week we talked about making disciples. If we're going to be followers of Jesus and He commanded us to go and make disciples, if we're going to do what He said to do, then, then, then we cannot do that apart from God's Word. Discipleship cannot happen apart from the truth of Scripture. We can become friends with somebody, but we can't make them a disciple without the Word of God. And that's an important aspect of making disciples is leading someone in the Word of God. This week, I don't know how many of you uh, follow the church on Facebook. If, you don't, if you're on Facebook and you don't follow SEC or like SEC, whatever the terminology is, be sure to do that this week. Because this week I, I put on there this, this book right here. It's called Multiply. And you can buy this book for like 6 or $8. Basically, what it is is it's a it's just a, a simple lesson thing that, that where you can walk somebody through through the basics of, of what it means. This is Christianity in a nutshell, in a paperback shell, whatever you want to call it. And this is a way to, to help you. This is another tool for a discipleship. It's to help you walk someone through. Maybe you you look at your life and you say, Man, I don't really even understand a lot about scripture. Well then I would say grab a tool like this and go through it with someone else, and both of you are gonna learn. And all this does is go through what, is, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be in the church? What, what are some highlights in the Old Testament that we need to understand? What are some things in the New Testament we need to understand? And it's, um, it's like 10, no, it's more than that. It's like 25 lessons. And so if you could set up with, with a friend of yours, somebody who you, who you already care about and who already knows you love them, and you could say, man, you know, I want to go through this. Would you like to go through it with me? You can do it over lunch or coffee or something like that. It's just another tool to get into God's Word. And it can be tough sometimes. It can be tough sometimes for us to read, much less to, to walk someone else through it. I understand that. But you can't learn. You can't grow apart from the Word of God. And so I, I, I made a list here. And this is actually this list I got from a, a lesson I did like six years ago. I found it uh, on, my, on one of my hard drives. Searching through some stuff, and I don't know where I got this. I'm sure I got this from somewhere, uh, so I should be giving somebody credit, but I don't know who to give it to, so I'll just take it. Um, and this is actually eight questions to ask when you're reading God's Word. And I don't want you to write these down. Don't write these down. You're, the temptation would be to write these down, but don't, because uh, at the end of the service today, I'm going to give each one of you a card that has these questions on it. So don't write these down. Let's just go through them. The first one is this. <clears throat> Is there a, a command to obey? When you're, reading, when you're reading Scripture, you can go through and you say, is God telling me do this or don't do that? Because if God says do this, then we know it's something we ought to do. If we're disciples, if we're going to follow Him, if we're going to follow Jesus, and he's, Jesus says do this, we have to do it. If He says don't do that, we know we better not do it because we're disciples. Number two, is there a godly principle I should follow? This is, a little bit, this is a little bit trickier to find sometimes because it's not a, a do this or don't do that. It's more like a, a general idea. You know, God favors this or good things happen when this happens. Or, you know, it's just a godly principle. Is there a godly principle I should follow? Number three, is there any promise to believe? And this is, this is something that, that is important. And, and a lot of churches focus on this and it's good. And, and, and I think maybe we could focus on it more. But, I, but I'm going to tell you, God has never made a promise that He has not kept. And so if you're reading scriptures, particularly if you look in the Old Testament, you can see where God's promises have been fulfilled, good and bad. When God said He was going to bless, He blessed. When God says, if you don't listen to me, bad things are going to happen, bad things happen. And so as you're reading scripture, that's an easy thing to look for. Is there a promise to believe? One of my favorite promises, that has, and for all Christians, it ought to be our favorite promise. Jesus is coming back. It's a promise that God has made for us, and we can have faith in that because, not because we can see into the future and know that that's going to happen, but because we have faith in God, because every other promise He's ever made has been fulfilled. God keeps His promises. Number four, is there a good example to follow? 
Is there a good example to follow? I mean, we can think of, uh, of, of examples of, of, of people in Scripture who, who did great things for God. Follow their example. Number five, is there a sin to avoid? Did, did one of these people who we thought was a good example commit a sin? You, I, I think about David. David is a good example. David has a heart like God. We ought to be like David. But David committed some sins. And in those areas, we ought to not be like David. <laughs> is there a sin to avoid? Number six, do I learn anything about God? Look for God's characteristics, God's attributes. They're listed. God tells us who He is and what He's about in His Word. And so when we read something, we can maybe find out something about God we didn't know. Or maybe it's something we'd heard about. And now we know where, where Scripture talks about it. Number seven, do I learn anything about man? What do I learn about myself or about the rest of mankind? In Romans, we find out that, that everyone has sinned. What do I find out about man? Number eight, finally. Is there anything I can ask God for? Is there anything that, that in Scripture, I read this and I look at this and, man, if only I could do that more, or if only I was more like that, if only I had that kind of heart. Is there anything when we read that you can ask God for? And maybe as you have these list of eight questions as you're reading and you begin to answer some of these, you can take notes. And uh, This is another good way to study and remember journal and Maybe write out some things you need to pray about and be thinking about those things during the day. Helps us learn. Helps us grow. The Bible just isn't a tool. And though it is a tool, Ephesians chapter 6 calls it a weapon. It's a sword. It's our weapon as Christians. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, He used this weapon against Satan. And that's one way where we can use this weapon. He, Hebrews chapter 4 says it's sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting and dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And so this, this, this sword of God divides us so that we can be opened up, examine ourselves, look at ourselves and say, you know, where do I need to be and, and who do I need to look like and how can I get there? But unfortunately, what we've done with this weapon too often is we've made it a sword to attack others. Christians are bad about this. Oh, you're divorced. Jesus hates, God hates divorce. Let me cut you up. You're struggling with a particular sin. Let me tell you what God says about that as I chop you into pieces. You're, you're homosexual. Let me hold a sign up and tell you what God says about that as I cut you down to size. That's not the kind of weapon this is. In fact, if we, if we want to make disciples, that's not how we use God's Word. And sometimes the truth hurts, and sometimes the truth needs to hurt, but sometimes the truth runs people away. Because we use it in such a way where we cut and we injure and we hurt. God's Word was not meant for that. God's Word was meant for compassion and loving. And, and, and there were times when Jesus used the Word of God to cut people down, but it wasn't when people were hurting. Jesus hung out with tax collectors and with sinners and with prostitutes. Never once did He cut them down with the Word of God. But when He came across people like, like me, when I first went to my, that first class where I thought I knew it all, when He came across the Pharisees who used God's Word to cut people down, that's when Jesus used it to cut them down. And so if we're going to make disciples, as we talked about last week, we can't use God's Word as a means to cut them off at the knees. We use God's Word as a way to, to tell people, this is God loves us and He creates these restrictions and these, these, this plan for us so that we can know Him better, so that our lives will be better. Not so that we can cut them apart. But by loving them, and so last week we talked about go and make disciples, and that that you know it, it's it's interesting because we can't we can't we can't beat somebody over the head with the Bible enough to, to make them a disciple. We can't we can't cut them up enough to make them a disciple. We can't arm wrestle them enough to make them a disciple. But we we make them a disciple by telling them what God has done for us, by how God has changed my life and how God has changed your life. When when people show see that we love them. We'll make disciples. 
Not because of anything we did. Because of everything that God has already done in Jesus. And so a, a disciple is a person of the Word. A disciple has in his toolbox Scripture. But a disciple is also a person of prayer. And this is one of the things that we take for granted often, I think. This idea of prayer that we can stand before God Almighty and speak to Him in such a way that He listens. Can you imagine going to a king's throne room and saying, Hey king, i, I got a couple of things I want to talk to you about. That, that doesn't happen. Can you imagine walking into our government and saying, Senator or President or whoever you are, I've got a few things. I've got a couple of things I want to talk to you about. That doesn't happen. But through prayer, we get to stand in the throne room of God and say, God, I want to talk to you about a few things. I got a couple questions for you. I got a couple things I don't understand. And, and frankly, I got a couple things I don't like. Do you think those things surprise God Almighty? He wants to hear those things from us. I had a friend who I, I worked with at Toyota for a long time, and his name's Tracy. And Tracy was a, is a big guy, and he, he, um, he's a Louisville University or Louisville University of Louisville football and basketball fan, and I still liked him anyway. Um, yeah, all of us have our issues, right? Yeah, th this was his. Tracy's actually a, 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 he preaches now on, on the weekends. He's still working at Toyota, and he preaches at a, a little uh, Church of Christ in, in Louisville. And uh, I was talking to Tracy one day at work, and you know we, we worked a, a, kind of across from each other some, and, and I got to talking to him, and he, he came in one day, and he said, i got to tell you this. He said, we were, we were in class at, at church on Sunday, and we were talking about prayer, and, and, and he said, the, the, the guy leading the class says, um, what is prayer and supplication? And supplication is just uh, making your request to God. And if you say, God, I need this, or God, I need help with that, you're, 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 you're making a supplication to God. And so, so this guy said, well, prayer is talking to God. The, the leader of the class said, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Well, what a supplication. And this guy says, ah, it's when you can't breathe. <laughs> and then, sometimes we get it mixed up, but it's, it's not when you can't breathe. Prayer is, is, is walking into the throne room of God. And because of the grace of God through Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And because of that, we, we have the ability to go to God and to, to, to walk up to Him and to say, God, here's what I need. Here's what, here's what problems am I having. Here's the struggles that I'm going through. And in this kind of one-on-one -on -one and, and, and back and forth, we can have a healthy relationship with God. Have you ever known a husband and wife who never talked, who had a good relationship? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And the same is true for us and God. I mean, can you imagine if, if a husband and wife, uh, if, if, they, if they rarely talked, maybe once every couple weeks, and the only time he, he talked to her was when he, he needed something. Hey, honey, um, can you do the dishes? Because, man, it's piling up. Or, or here, hey, hey I, I need you to fix me supper. Can you, I mean, ladies, how would that work? It wouldn't work, right? Or, or husbands, what, what about if, if you never heard from your wife a, a, except when, when she was complaining? You need to do this better. You didn't take care of that. I don't like the way you did that. I mean, that, that's, that's not a healthy relationship. And the same is true for us and God. If we never talk to God except to make requests, man, that, there's got to be more than that. If we never talk to God except to say, God, I, I didn't like the way you handled that situation, or God, you should have done this differently, or I don't agree with you on that, then, then, then we're going to struggle in our relationship with God. God's Word is Him communicating with us in prayer. It's us communicating with Him. And we go to Him like, like a, a child goes to His Father. Communicating. In good times, we, we offer up thanksgiving. God, thank You for giving me this, for blessing me with that, for, for allowing the sun to rise today. In, in bad times, we go to Him and say, God, be with me, strengthen me, strengthen them. I don't understand, but I need You. In all times, if you're angry with God, He's okay with you going to Him with that. Now, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a rocky road if that's all you ever talk to Him about. Just like it would be in your, your marriage relationship. 
But God wants to hear from you. If you don't agree with God, if you don't understand God, if you struggle with the decision He made, there's nothing wrong with going to Him with that. He's not surprised by that. He's heard it before. It doesn't catch Him off guard. Cry out to Him. And too often in the good times, we forget to thank God. We say, man, look at all that good stuff I did. I made that happen. And in the bad times, we like to point the finger and say, God, look what you did wrong here. We forget. God is a loving Father who gives us life and sustains us and gives us hope for the future. And prayer communicates our love and appreciation and thanksgiving in our hurts, in our struggles, in all of these things. And we take it for granted. But prayer is powerful. And most of us, if we develop this pattern of prayer life, we would begin to see this more often, that the prayer changes things. I don't know how many of you are readers, but if you, if you like reading and you want to read a book about prayer that's outstanding, it's, it's probably 10 or 15 years old now, but it was written by a, a guy named Jim Cimbala who's, who leads, uh, he did lead, I, I assume he still does, the Brooklyn Tabernacle. You guys have heard about the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Uh, that church, Jim Cimbala leads that church, and he wrote a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's, for some of you, it'll be, if you don't come from a tradition of um, charismatic, it's, it might be a little more charismatic than you um, are used to. But for some of you, who it, it's a good book to read. And in, in, in his book, he wrote this. He says, the devil is not terribly frightened by our human efforts and credentials, but he knows his kingdom will be damaged when we begin to lift our hearts to God. And he's talking about through prayer. When we begin to lift our hearts to God, when we begin to lift up our concerns, our needs, our struggles, our temptations to God, then we can make things happen through God, and God wants to make things happen through us for his kingdom. And so if we're going to be disciples, we need to be people of prayer. And as we think about this idea of being a disciple and what it means for us to be a disciple and what it means for us to grow and to continue to grow and all of these things and to go and make disciples, one of the best prayers that Jesus asked us to pray is in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Jesus said this, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. I mean, don't you think God has a desire to answer this prayer? Sure He does. I mean, if Jesus asks us to go and to pray for this specifically so that this will specifically happen, man, this is a prayer we ought to be praying. And if we're going to become a, be a church of, of disciples who make disciples, who, who, who make more disciples, then we need to be praying this prayer. And so on the card that, I'm going to hand, that we're going to hand out today that has your eight questions when reading Scripture on the bottom of this, it has that, that verse, Luke 10, 2. And I want you guys to put this card in your Bible or put the, and, 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 I'm, and don't just put this in your Bible and stick your Bible somewhere. Put this where you see it. If you have to tape it to your, to your mirror when you're getting ready in the morning so that you remember to pray and to study, then do that. But, but every time you read, I want you to pray this prayer. Lord, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Send out laborers, because you know what's going to happen? Before long, you'll start thinking, man, you know, Jesus is right. There's not enough laborers. We need more laborers. And your heart begins to change, and you think, you know, I could be a laborer. I could be a disciple who makes disciples who makes disciples who makes more. And what begins to happen is we change this church, this people, this body. And some of these seats that are empty now aren't. And then we begin to change this community where we're reaching people where we didn't reach before because they begin to see the love of Christ in us. And they don't understand that maybe. But they know that we care. And then that grows because we've made this exponential growth by making disciples who make disciples who make more. And before long, this city has changed in the state, in this country. And if that sounds like far-fetched, then, then I encourage you to look at, at Acts. Because that's exactly what happened in the first century church when people realized that they were disciples of Christ who had died for them and they were their, their job, their responsibility was to go out and to lovingly and compassionately make disciples. And because of them, the world changed forever. 
And so what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your tools of discipleship, with God's Word and with prayer? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge each and every one of you this week to, to begin to make things happen in your life, to develop positive habits, to begin reading Scripture each day and praying. Each day. What if you, you know, weekends are hard sometimes, all, sometimes you get, you know, you got stuff going on, you're out of town. You, what if you just did it during your work week? What if you begin to take little baby steps that you're not, you're not taking now, and you begin to take these steps to, to make things happen, to make things change? So I want to challenge you. 10 or 15 minutes. Read some scripture. Look at those questions. Is there anything that God wants me to do? Is there any sin God wants me to avoid? Is there any challenge, any principle? Is there anything? You know, all of those questions that we talked about. And begin by praying every day this prayer. Lord, is, the harvest is plentiful, full, but the workers are few. Send out workers. And things will start to change. We're going to sing a song. If the praise team want to come on up. We're going to have an invitation, which we do every week for those of you who are new. And it's, it's this idea that we're going to give you an opportunity to come to know Jesus. If you, if you don't know Him, then come to know Him. If you have prayer requests, we're available. If you want to make Snowball Christian Church your home, then we can do that too. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, I, I completely understand. That's, that's a scary thing for some of you. Then I would say find someone who you know is a follower of Jesus and, and go talk to them. Find someone who is who's a leader or, or just a friend who follows Jesus. But don't let these days go by too far that, that you're not asking someone, what does it mean to be a disciple? And how do I do that? Let's pray. Father God, thank You so much for these tools that You've given us. These tools are incredibly valuable. Your Word and prayer they help us to be who You've called us to be as disciples, as followers of Jesus. Thank You so much for that, Lord. Father, I pray that as we, as we go into this part of the service, if there's anyone who doesn't know Jesus, who wants to know Jesus, I pray that You would give them the courage to step out. Lord, I pray that You also give those of us who are followers of Jesus the courage to be the disciples that You've called us to be. To go and to change the world, not on our own, but by making disciples who make disciples who make more. Thank you so much for your grace through Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Please stand.